Um, this is the area of land that, uh, rather like a sheep, I have become hefted to over the course of my 47 years, and my family has been hefted here since 1911. Uh, so we're on to the third generation of, of Robert's farming here in, in Kilnsey. Um, and what we can see in the picture here, obviously, is Kilnsey Crag, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. We've got the River Wharf and um, the village of Coniston, where I was, where I was born many, many moons ago. Um, a little bit about me. I have a varied career and background. I was in conservation and still am in conservation before I came back to the farm 10 years ago. That included taking me to places as far afield as the Himalayas, where I was uh, helping to conserve traditional buildings, and the remote South Atlantic island of St. Helena, where I was helping to conserve, among other things, the world's rarest tree, which is known uh, as the bastard gumwood. And we helped to, we helped to, there was basically one tree left and we helped to, uh, we helped to propagate. Uh, I think we've got about 300 growing on the island now. Um, so I came back to the Dales in July uh, 2011 and took over the family business, which includes the farm and various other interests from mum and dad, who are still going strong. Um, some of my interests, apart from nature and, uh, and, and family, is fell running. So you can see me struggling my way around the Kilnsey Crag race. Uh, I think that was about four years ago. And um, I would say I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but there is a kind of thrill involved in running down that virtually precipitous cliff face that, uh, that, that makes you aware of the, the value of life. Um, anyway, in terms of uh, today's talk, just a rough outline. I'm going to start, start by talking about some of the early pioneers of sustainability of farming here in the Dales, uh, moving on to having a look at, at what sustainable farming looks like today, um, then talk a little bit very briefly about my family and how we came to be farming here in the Dales, because I think that does shed some light on some of the things that we've done here at Kilnsey. And finally, and critically importantly, what does the future hold for for farming in the Dales, for life in the Dales, um, which I'm sure is very, very pertinent to all of you supporting the um, Friends of the Dales. So, early pioneers. Here we have a monk walking through his flock, and that would have been a very familiar sight uh, going back to the 1100s. The Cistercian monks of Fountains Abbey were gifted extensive lands around Kilnsey in 1151, uh, not just Kilnsey. Overall at that time, they had something like a million acres of land. And what they were doing with that land was farming large, large flocks of sheep. Um, what's fascinating is that it was hugely profitable at the time and remained so right through to the dissolution. And wool traders were coming from as far afield as, as Northern Italy to gain and to gain access to this to this market of wool, which at the time was 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 sort of the number one fabric, if you like. So, so in terms of early pioneers of sustainable farming, I think that you know the monks were very much a, a model that we could do with following today. Of course, moving on to the more recent times, um, we've got the hill farmers, and hill farming really hasn't changed significantly. In, in the last few hundred years. And I think what's impressive about hill farming is that it meets the definition of sustainability in lots of ways. It's low intensity, it's resource efficient, it works in harmony with the land. And crucially, it's less damaging to the environment than many other types of, of, of more commercial farming that we might see today. I mean, even today, a good farmer will know how many beasts his land will support. He'll know how many to fit on per hectare, and he'll know crucially when to move them from one area of his land to another. Um, there's an old saying that no sheep should hear the church bells in the same field twice. It means that sort of at least every two weeks, the sheep should be moving from one field or one area of the hill to another. Uh, and all of that helps to, to, to keep a sort of 
quality of grazing across different habitat types and it maintains that mosaic of habitats which makes the dales and, and other upland areas so rich for wildlife and biodiversity. So, so hill farming really is a, is a model for sustainable farming. But unfortunately, when we talk about sustainable farming today, sustainable too often means economically sustainable and not much else. It means bigger, better, faster, more. We're looking at unparalleled efficiency and productiveness, more akin to a factory line than, than a scene from, from Turner or Wordsworth. It's, everything is driven by increased demand, by supermarket pressures, you know, the cost pressures of a small number of buyers saying, this is what we're willing to pay for this product. Of course, we've got customer expectations of cheap food, which have been in place for decades now. We expect our supermarket shop to not take too much of our, of our weekly of our weekly, you know, weekly earnings, if you like. And, and that's in stark contrast to maybe 40, 50 years ago when food was really what the majority of, 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 of our income went on. That's all changed. And of course, there are costs to this farming. Yes, economically sustainable, but damaging to the welfare, you know, impacting negatively on the environment in many ways. And I think we shouldn't forget about the farmer's quality of life. I think most farmers now wouldn't necessarily choose this. They wouldn't choose this high intensity factory line system. It's what they've been driven to produce by, by the kind of economic system that we have in place today and it affects their quality of life hugely. Uh, and we'll see later on how that's, how that's reducing the number of young people coming into farming because it's, it's hellish hard work. The farmers that I know will be working seven days a week. They'll be working 14 to 16 hours a day. And, and still at the end of that, it's a struggle to make, to make ends meet. And when we talk about economic sustainability, but actually if you look at dairy farming right now, the average dairy farmer is losing several pence for every litre of milk that they produce, even with all this productivity and intensity. So we have to start to question where, where are we going with this? Of course, the alternative models, well, we don't have to look too far for these. Um, I've already talked a bit about hill farming and <laughs> here's, a, here's a familiar site from, from the hills surrounding my house and, and, and many of the valleys up and down the dales. And, and what's refreshing here is that the new ways don't look hugely different from the old ways. OK, the horse has been repa replaced by a, a quad bike, um, but everything is low intensity. It's in harmony with the land. But and, and this is a big but this kind of system currently isn't productive enough to feed the nearly eight billion of us on, on, on the planet. And also it's dependent on grants. So it's not simple enough to say that we can switch everything over to this this way of doing things you know amazing though that would be for you know for the planet so i'm going to stop just for a minute to talk about how my family came into farming and we had a slightly different route to perhaps many other dales farming families um, everything for us began in the smoggy mills of west yorkshire so my Great, great grandfather, James Roberts, who's pictured on the left there, he came to own Salts Mill in 1893, having worked his way up from basically being a humble weaver's lad who lived in Haworth. And he was, uh, he was a sharp cookie. So he worked his way up to, after the Salt family, um, they left the mill, um, Titus passed on and Titus Jr., he, he took the, he took the mill over for a few years, but it went bankrupt when there was a downturn in the late 1880s. And, and that's where my great great grandfather came in. And, and at the time, there was 4000 workers in the mill and the whole future of the enterprise was really lying in the balance. But, um, but my great great grandfather saw something and he thought that he could bring it back to life again. And surely enough, he did. He was he was a very interesting man. As I said, he started he started life on the streets of Haworth and his father was a farmer. They didn't have two beans to rub together, but he was an ambitious and hardworking young man and he worked his way up. He was a restless innovator. He was extraordinarily for the 1870s. He was a 
he was a traveler. He, he learned, he taught himself Russian and he traveled to Russia on more than a dozen occasions, basically seeking out um, alternative types of wool. And he found the merino wool of the Caucasus, the Caucasian mountains, which was then South Russia and is now Georgia today. And he brought that wool back and, and he had the monopoly of that for a number of years and, and that helped to make his fortune. And he was always investing in, pro in progress. So when he took on the mill in the 1890s, there was a huge investment needed and he put, um, he put a huge fortune into new machinery and productivity to basically bring the mill back so that, so that during the early 20th century, Salt's Mill was the most productive mill in the world. And it wasn't until the war came along that it knocked things a bit. And, um, and my great, great grandfather, he lost a number of his children in the war and he decided that he wasn't gonna be able to continue with the mill. So it was sold in, in 1918, but he was very much the archety archetypal late Victorian industrialist. And one of the things he did in 1911 was to purchase the Kilnsey estate, which, was, uh, which is near to Grassington, just north of Skipton in Upper Wharfdale. Um, he was planning to retire to that, which, which never materialized, but my family is still living on the estate today. So how do we come into farming? Well, in the middle, you can see my grandfather, uh, William Roberts, and he took on the running of the estate and he was a very keen farmer. He was particularly interested in, in innovative types of dairy breed. And, um, and so, yeah, he farmed, he farmed for all of his life. Um, and then you move forward again. My father, has he's been farming. He's 83 years old, still going strong on the farm, still helping out with the lambing every springtime. Um, and he was probably getting slowly more interested in conservation. And he's given me that interest and that passion as well for looking after the land. So, so it's sort of strange in, in a little over 100 years how we've, how we've kind of moved from industry through farming to conservation. Um, but, but here we are on the land. Now, for most of, most of my family's time here at Kilnsey, I would probably say that sheep farming and dairy farming were the key, were the key farming interests. But probably starting round about the 1970s, everything started to change. Um, we'd gone into the common market, uh, dairy prices crashed, there was a number of other pressures on farming, and that resulted in what we see today, which is, which is this sort of restless change, this need for diversification, seen not only here on our farm at Kilnsey, but across all farms, you know, the length and breadth of the UK, but particularly in these marginal farms where, where livings are tough in, in the hills. So um, I'm just going to give you a potted history of some of the diversification that we've seen here at Kilnsey um, since, since the turn of 1970, really. We started trout farming in the late 1970s, and that at the time was something that was pushed by the government, by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farming, and it was something that we imported from Scandinavia. And today we're producing about 60 tonnes of rainbow trout a year, which we put into lakes and ponds across the north of England. At the same time, my father dug out some fishing lakes. That was probably about 1979. And obviously fishing remains sort of one of the major recreational activities, if not the most popular here in the UK. A pony trekking centre. So uh, my my mum and my aunt started, uh, they, they bought some horses in from Wales in 1981, and we now offer pony trekking. Visitor attraction. So uh, in the early days, people used to come along to feed the trout. Um, now we have a nature trail, obviously fishing for kids. We have farm animals. In the early 1990s, we started with a farm shop, which at that time was all the vogue. Things were, were sort of trying to, to balance themselves from the kind of hegemony of the supermarket. So people were trying to get food that was from, you know, fresh from the field. So we opened up our own farm shop. And at the same time, we opened up a cafe, which still goes strong today up at Kilnsey. Shortly after that, in 1994, we opened up a smokehouse where we, we were smoking the fish that was produced on site and also other types of game and meats, really with a focus on local provenance. 
holiday accommodation. That probably followed in about 2014 when we converted this barn, which was formerly a cow barn, into a, into a holiday let. And more recently, probably in the last five years, we've moved to letting out the land for weddings. So, yep, we've been quite, we've been quite restless for change and we are quite diverse. Um, and alongside of that, as I said, my father and myself have a real passion for, for looking after the environment. So we're managing probably about 700 acres of triple SI, that site of special scientific interest. So we've got areas of upland that are incredibly important for their botanical diversity, for the populations of wading birds they support, for the curlews and everything else. And, 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 and they're very precious areas of land that haven't been affected by modern farming intensification. So we're very, we're very privileged to look after a chunk of that. Um, here I am looking at the lady slipper orchid. And I, I love the lady slipper orchid. It's one of those um, all too rare conservation, happy ending stories. The lady slipper orchid used to grow all across the Yorkshire Dales in the north of England, but over the course of the 17, 1800s, it was gradually picked to the verge of extinction, to the point where at the beginning of the 20th century, there was no plants known to be left in existence. It was, it was functionally extinct. And then around about 1930, a couple of walkers were out in a woodland uh, somewhere in the Dales, and they rediscovered a plant. And it took many, many years and many, many special scientific minds from Kew Gardens and elsewhere to work out how to mass produce the Lady Slipper Orchid. And we were very honoured to be one of the first sites as a reintroduction site for the Lady Slipper Orchid. And, and that was round about 2012 when we saw our first plant being planted here, having been grown at Kew. And uh, today we have about 20, I think 18 plants and I think about 14 of them flowered uh, this year. So it, it shows that when we put the effort and the focus into conservation, we really can achieve great, great things. Now, red squirrels. Uh, my mother is, is something of an expert on red squirrels and we started captive breeding red squirrels back in uh, 1998. And at the moment, sadly, we aren't able to let them out around the Dales, but we do, we send them to a National Captive Breeding Centre down in London, and they have gone as far afield as the Isle of Wight, uh, the Isle of Man, the Scilly Isles. Um, we do, of course, happily still have a population of wild red squirrels here in the Dales, up in the Snaysham area near to Hawes. But when my father was young, in, you know, in the 1950s, we would have had red squirrels up and down the dales. So, so we're doing our little bit to try and boost the population. And I know that the Woodland Trust and others are doing great work up at Snaysham to try and increase the area of habitat. Um, water, so what's water got to do with sustainability? Well, this is at the top of our, of our site, of our trout farm site. And in the background, you can see a dam that was put in by my grandfather in 1933, um, so ahead of the national grid coming to Upper Wharfdale, my great, my grandfather put in a dam and he had his own little hydro turbine which provided power for the village. And today, um, it was about 2001, we actually brought the hydro back to life. We reinstalled a turbine and today we create about 40 kilowatt hours uh, peak output, which um, in, in layman's terms is enough to power about 10 homes at any one time. So um, that's fantastic. And we've also got solar panels as well. So um, that covers us. If it's not raining, then we can rely on the sun to create a few kilowatt hours as well. So, so we really take this, you know, we take this very seriously. The fact that we want to try and leave no hoof print or footprint on the dales, and we want to try and make ourselves as, you know, as close to, to carbon neutral uh, as we possibly can be. And, I, and I'm, I'm proud to say that we are better than carbon neutral. We're, we're carbon negative because we actually export power to the national grid for about 10 months of the year. 
which is which is which is fantastic and i think you know this model of micro generation is very much the way that we need to go in this country i think you know it's one thing to have these big huge nuclear schemes but i think neighborhood power and neighborhood power generation and community power generation is the model for the for the future so there's an awful lot there about diversification and environment. Well, what happens to the farming, I hear you ask? You know, isn't that what brought you to the Dales in the first place? And, and hasn't that been the core, the core of Dales life for so long? Well, we do still have some sheep, but on a vastly reduced number. So back in, in at our peak, probably in the mid 1980s, we had something like 800 ewes who on an average year would have produced two lambs each. So we'd have been, you know, getting on for two and a half thousand sheep um, in the summertime grazing the land. We now have 40. So it's quite a reduction, but it's a reflection that uh, mum and dad, who you can see in the, in the photo here, have kind of reached close to retirement age, although I think farmers uh, farmers never actually retire. They keep going until until they too are, uh, are, are grazing the grass. Um, so yeah, the 40 sheep we have reflects about 5% of what we had formerly. Um, the majority of our land, uh, what we aren't using for, for weddings and, and other events is basically let out to neighboring farmers now. And um, that works for them and it works for us because um, one of the things about the modern sheep farming system is that farms have got bigger. You know, I think in, uh, in my dad's lifetime, there would have been seven farms in Coniston. There is now one. And that's a reflection that sheep farmers need more land and bigger flocks to be able to make, to eke out a living. So, so we let a lot of our land out, but we're, 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 we're happy to see that there's still sheep grazing it, even though they're not necessarily our sheep. I'll just stop to say that the photo in the right hand side there, we've got mum and dad, uh, myself, my two boys and my nephew. So um, hopefully there will be a continuity for the future and I'll come on to talk a little bit more about the future um, later on. So in terms of the future for, for farming itself, well, what does it look like? Hopefully not a robot running through, through although some, some of farming will get, will certainly get robotized and, and already is, you know, some of the, uh, some of the dairy milkers are effectively, effectively robots, but um, let's hope that that's not what we're going to see looking after the land in the Dales. So uh, on a policy level, we've got, um, we've got a new grants, grant scheme system coming in called ELMS, the Environmental Land Management System which is the successor to the current agri-environment scheme that we have going at the moment. Um, so that's gonna hugely influence and impact on how, how we farm, not just the Dales, but the whole of, the, the whole of this island. There's an opportunity there because we can move away from, from, from paying farmers just to produce food, um, to actually paying, paying them to do public goods and to provide public services. And you know some of those, some of those public goods and services include, you know, managing the landscape, you know, keeping the dry stone walls up, looking after the barns. They include enhancing biodiversity. So things like, you know, helping to reintroduce the lady slipper orchid, helping to reverse the decline of curly populations. Flood alleviation, and this is going to become a much, much bigger issue. We've seen it already recently with some of the devastating floods that we've had in the last few years. Already in my lifetime, we probably moved from the river wharf used to flood the valley possibly once every two or three years. And for the last few winters, it's been once or twice a, a year, possibly two, three times a year. And, and that's, you know, that's gonna have huge impacts for all of us. So in the uplands, we have a role to play because we can help to soak up some of that water by blocking moorland grips, by, by re reflooding re certain areas of, of the valley bottom by creating wet woodland and, 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 and storage areas for water, which then helps to ensure that Tadcaster and York don't flood downstream. So, so, so this new system will hopefully move towards looking at a more holistic way of, of paying farmers to provide all of these public goods, which are so, so desperately needed. And climate change, of course, we've just seen the whole COP26 conference, and we've seen what a huge 
huge responsibility it is for all of us to try and keep to this 1.5 degrees. And farming has its role to play in that. You know, huge methane uh, emissions come from farming and, 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 and we've got a role to reduce that. And also the, the chemical inputs, you know, the amount of, you know, fertilizers and, and, and pesticides that, that have to be put onto the land to support this, in, this intensive farming. We need to move away from all of that. We need to minimize that. And of course, carbon offsetting. You know, we've got these huge moorland areas of peat, which are helping to, you know, carbon sinks. They're helping to lock in carbon. They need to be looked after. And of course, there's opportunities to, to capture more carbon by, by planting trees. And that's a huge target. I know I know for the dales and for other areas to plant trees, but, but we have to make sure obviously that the, the trees go in the right places. We can't simply be, be planting trees willy nilly because people cherish the kind of open landscapes, the limestone pavements that the Yorkshire Dales offer. So, so there's, there's kind of tough decisions to make, but also great, great opportunities there for farmers to be at the fore, forefront of delivering, delivering these public goods. And we've talked about ELMS and how that's a government supported system, but, but the government aren't going to be able to or willing to fit the bill for all of this. So there's going to be a role for private sector investment. And we're already seeing, you know, innovative pilot schemes whereby private sector investment is helping to fund some of these, some of this tree planting and some of these and some of these carbon offsetting uh, programs which helps you know industry and and airlines and such and and, and sure some of this there's an, there's an element of greenwashing but if, if if some if some of that if some of that guilt can translate into 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 money and positive investment in our rural landscapes then at least something good is coming out of this um but at the moment a lot of this is in flux a lot of this is is up in the air and it's creating massive uncertainty in farming uh, not for the first time. I mean, we probably saw something similar in the 1970s, and we've seen it. We've seen it periodically before that. We've seen we've seen boom and bust in 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 the in the hill farming economy. You know, the 1930s, for instance, was a time of bust, and there was huge emigration from the land. So, so unfortunately, this un uncertainty is not. It's not really helping to helping to give you know, the older generation of farmers confidence that they can pass it on to the younger generation. And it's not necessarily giving the younger generation the, the incentive and, 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 and the, the security that they know that, that upland farming is, is a good steady way of life. So we're still, we're, we're very much at a kind of crossroads at the moment. So, you know, what does this new role for farmers look like? I've talked about you know some of the public goods and services that, that that can be offered but but are we looking at a future where farmers are, are more countryside rangers than actual farmers um you know are we are we like green keepers on the golf course you know offering education as well and 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 is that something that that farmers are going to be happy to take on these are all these are all questions um which at the moment don't have a clear answer there are new parts as well. You know, this is a landscape that isn't just about farming. It's about recreation and leisure, about well-being. You know, fell running is making a huge comeback. I think when I was when I was young, probably the Kilnsey Crag Race might have had 20 or 30 entrants. It's now full every year. It can take a maximum of 100 competitors. And so there are, so there's more people wanting to come up to the dales to, to enjoy the fresh air, to you know, to, to get the benefits of the well-being and the mindfulness. So, so with that will come new opportunities for how we, how we manage and, and fund the landscape. So it's not all doom and gloom. And, and, and just, it's an interesting, interesting aside here that the early fell runners, um, they weren't professional athletes, they were farmhands. They were young men who were basically used to chasing sheep up and down hills. And, and that's where the sport of fell running came from. So things are kind of coming full circle. I think, and, and this is from all that I've said about the uncertainty and about where does farming go, the real concern is how is the culture going to survive? The culture that we know it. Dale's life has traditionally revolved around farming for hundreds of years, the harvest time, the sheep gathering. You know, I remember when, when I was younger, basically the, the sheep, the, the harvest time would involve not just my own family, but other families as well. We would come together to help each other gather in the bales. And 
all of that's changed with the mechanization of farming. There's such a small number of people farming a massive landscape now. And that farming community was responsible for supporting events like Kilmsey Show. And here's a, here's a photo of, of the sheep judging at Kilmsey Show. Kilmsey Show has been going for 125 years now. And it's always relied on that farming community to support it, to do the jobs, to, to plan it, to set it up, to, to run the sheep section and the dry stone walling section, to judge the cattle and, and to oversee the thole running. So we're dealing with a kind of dwindling pool of people who are necessary, you know, who are available to take on, you know, take on this, this, this privilege and this responsibility for keeping, you know, the Dales farming culture going. So, so there's very much, you know, a question of, of how these traditional events are going to survive in the future. It's all going to rely on this little guy or little guys like him. You know, it's the next generation. And, you know, we have to look optimistically that there will be the fresh blood to take on what the older generation is currently doing. And when I say older generation, you know, the average age of a farmer now in the Dales is probably 60 plus. You know, my dad is 83 and still farming. And this is concerning because it means that at this time of great, great change, we've got an aging farming population. Um, and we need more, we need more of these, we need more children um, and younger people, young farmers coming into it. And for that to happen, they need to know that this is, a, this is, a, this is an attractive opportunity for them, that those long hours are gonna be worth it, that there is gonna be at the end of the day, a living to be made on these hills. Um, and, you know, just talking about how we get more young people into farming, we can see one particular lady is certainly doing her duty. And there's, a, there's Amanda, who a lot of you will know from her TV programs and other media appearances. And, um, yeah, maybe what we're looking, looking for is people to move back to having larger families again, as they would have done in the old days. Um, but seriously, change is coming. And it's going to be a major generational change to the Dales, to farming in the Dales, to our landscape. But hang on, this isn't the first time that we've heard that. Because back in the 1930s, people were saying something very similar about the arrival of the tractor, which was a form of black magic or witchcraft that was going to lead to the end of days in the Dales and the, you know, the removal of, of farming as we know it. Yes, it did change things. And uh, my grandfather was one of the first people to have a Massey Ferguson, I think in the early 1940s in the Upper Dales. And I'm sure a lot of the local farmers probably looked sideways at him. But the tractor then replaced the Dales pony as the workhorse of the farm. And, uh, and without it, farming of any shape probably wouldn't have survived. So we do sporadically see these these huge quantum shifts in farming. And Dales farmers and other farmers are a remarkably resilient breed who have a way of adapting to survive. And we just have to hope that that's gonna be the case yet again. And I think really, when we look at farming and sustainable farming and what that's gonna look like in the future, it's going to be a mosaic of different things. Yes, there's going to be some traditional farming continuing, but there's also going to be some recreation. There's going to be entertainment provided for visitors. There's going to be education. And of course, importantly, there's going to be a focus on looking after the landscape. And that's going to be really important for the future. And I think, you know, for all the fear of change, there are still sheep on the fells. There are still cows plodding into the dairies twice a day. There are still farmers looking at the skies with anxiety as we lead into harvest time. These things haven't changed and hopefully they won't change. And on a sort of final passing note, even if they do change, one thing we can, sure about, we can be sure about is that the land will endure and whatever is happening on the land and whatever the farming looks like in the future, this landscape will be there. It might not look exactly the same, but then we only have to go back a thousand years to before the monks, when the whole landscape would have been a lot more wooded to realize that this is a landscape also that has changed massively. 
most of the dry stone walls dating from the 16, 1700s. Before that, it would have been an open landscape. So nothing is static, nothing, nothing stands still. And I think, you know, we can maybe look with a, with a strange kind of reassurance that, that perhaps the sheep will outlive us and they will be there quietly munching on the hills long after we've gone. So, so, so yeah, that's, that's my take on, on sustainability and farming. And, and thank you very much for listening today. Thank you.